Recording 63. You will hear a telephone conversation between two friends called Julie and Nick about cheap accommodation in the city of Darwin, Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Hi Nick, it's Julie. Have you managed to find any information about accommodation in Darwin? Hi, I was just going to call you. I found some on the internet. There are quite a few hostels for backpackers there. The first possibility I found was a hostel called Top End Backpackers. OK. It's pretty cheap. You can get a bed in a dormitory for $19 per person. Private rooms cost a bit more, but we'll be OK in dormitories, won't we? Sure. So, that hostel has parking, though that doesn't really matter to us, as we'll be using public transport. Yeah. Are there any reviews on the website from people who have been there? Well, yes. They aren't all that good, though. Some people said they didn't like the staff, they had an unfriendly attitude. Hmm. That's quite unusual in a hostel. Usually all the staff are really welcoming. That's what I thought. People said they liked the pool and the fact that the rooms had air conditioning. But the problem with that was that it was very noisy, so they were kept awake. But it was too hot if they turned it off, so they had to put up with it. Someone told me there's another hostel called Gumtree something. Mm, Gumtree Lodge. It costs a bit more. $45 a person. What? Oh, no. <laughs> That's for private rooms. It's twenty-three fifty for the dorms. <laughs> That's more like it. It looks to be in quite a good location. A bit out of town and quiet, but with good transport and quite near a beach. Has it got a pool? Yes, and its own gardens. The reviews for that one are mostly OK, except for one person who said they couldn't sleep because there were insects flying around in the dormitories. Not for me, then. And I'd rather be somewhere central, really. Right. There's a place called Kangaroo Lodge. They've got dorms at $22, and it's downtown near all the restaurants and clubs and everything. So that should suit you. And it doesn't close at night. So there's always someone on reception? That sounds good. The only criticism I saw was that the rooms were a bit messy and untidy because people just left their clothes and stuff all over the beds and the floor. Don't hostels usually have lockers in the bedrooms where you can leave your stuff? Yeah. They do usually, but apparently they don't here. Still, hostels are never particularly tidy places, so that doesn't bother me. And the same person said that the standard of cleanliness was pretty good, and especially the bathrooms. They were excellent as far as that went. Right. Yeah, I reckon Kangaroo Lodge sounds the best. Me too. Quite a lot of people reviewing it said it was really fun there, like, every night everyone staying there got together and ended up having a party. So it sounds like it's got a really good atmosphere. OK, let's go for that one. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Did you get the address of Kangaroo Lodge? 
Yes, it's on Shadforth Lane. Can you spell that? S H A D F O R T H. It's near the transit centre, where the intercity buses and the airport buses drop you off. Cool. I'm really looking forward to this. I've never stayed in a hostel before. Do they provide bed linen, sheets, and things? Yeah, and you can usually either bring your own towel or hire one there, but they don't usually provide those for free. Okay. And what happens about meals? Well, you don't have to pay extra for breakfast. It varies a lot in different places, but generally it's okay. And there's usually a cafe where you can buy a snack or a hot meal for lunch. But actually, if you're really travelling on the cheap, usually for every five or six rooms, there's a kitchen where you can knock up a snack, and that saves a lot of money. Great. Right. Well, shall I go ahead and book that? That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Recording sixty four. You will hear a guide at an outdoor sculpture park talking to a group of visitors. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Anglia Sculpture Park. Right. Well, the idea behind the sculpture park is that it's a place where works of art, such as large sculptures and carvings, can be displayed out of doors in a natural setting. As you'll have noticed when you drove here, most of the land around the park is farmland. The park itself belonged to a family called the De Quinces. Who had made a lot of money from manufacturing farm machinery, and who also owned substantial stretches of forest land to the north of the park. They built a house in the centre of the park, not far from where we're standing now. But this burnt down in 1980, and the De Quinces then sold the land. The Anglia Sculpture Park isn't the only one in the country. Several of the London parks sometimes display contemporary sculptures, and there are a couple of other permanent sculpture parks in England. But we're unique in that some of our sculptures were actually created for the sites they occupy here, and we also show sculptures by a wider range of artists than anywhere else in the country. For example, at present we have an exhibition by Joe Tremaine of what he calls burnt sculptures. These are wood and stone sculptures that he's carved and marked with fire to illustrate the ferocity and intensity of the forces that have shaped our planet over millions of years. They look really dramatic in this rural setting. To see some of the sculptures. You'll need to follow the path alongside the lower lake. We had to renovate this after the lake overflowed its banks a couple of months ago and flooded the area. The water levels back to normal now, and you shouldn't have any trouble. The path's very level underfoot. You should be back at the visitor centre at about four o'clock. 
If you have time, it's worth taking a look at the centre itself. It's not possible to go upstairs at present, as builders are working there adding another floor. But the rest's well worth seeing. The architect was Guy King. He was actually born in this part of England, but he recently designed a museum in Canada that won a prize for innovation in public buildings. If you want to get something to eat when you get back, like a snack or a sandwich, the terrace room is currently closed. But you can go to the kiosk and buy something, then sit on one of the chairs overlooking the lower lake and enjoy the view as you're eating. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, let me just tell you a bit about what you can see in the sculpture park. If you look at your map, you'll see the visitor centre, where we are now, at the bottom, just by the entrance. Since we only have an hour, you might not be able to get right around the park, but you can choose to visit some of the highlights. You might like to take a look at the Joe Tremaine sculptures, which are displayed on this side of the upper lake, just behind the education centre and near the bridge. They're really impressive, but please remember not to let your children climb on them. One of our most popular exhibitions is the Giorgio Catalucci bird sculptures. They're just across the bridge on the north side of the lower lake. I love the way they're scattered around in the long grass beside the lake, looking as if they're just about to take to their wings. You could also go to the garden gallery. It's on this side of the upper lake. From the visitor centre, you go to the education centre, then keep on along the path and you'll see it on your right. There's an exhibition of animal carvings there which is well worth a look. We also have the Long House. That's quite a walk. From here, you go to the bridge and then turn left on the other side. Soon you'll see a winding pathway going up towards the northern boundary of the park. Go up there and you'll find it at the top. They have some abstract metal sculptures that are well worth seeing if you have time. OK, well, now... if you're that is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Recording 61. You will hear two students discussing their assignments. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Hi, Mike. How's it going? Actually, I was up last night with an assignment, so yeah, I'm tired, but I guess we'd better sort this presentation out. Well, we've done enough background reading, but I think we need to organise exactly what we're going to say about biofuels during the presentation and the order. 
I thought we could start by asking our audience what car engines were first designed to run on. Fossil fuels or biofuels? Nice idea. Yes. When most people think about cars and fuel, they think about all the carbon dioxide that's produced, but they don't realise that that wasn't always the case. You're probably right. The earliest car engines ran on fuel made from corn and peanut oil, didn't they? Yes. The manufacturers used the corn and peanut oil and turned them into a kind of very pure alcohol. You mean ethanol? Yes. In fact, most biofuels are still based on ethanol. Actually, I've got some notes here about the process of turning plant matter into ethanol, the chemical reactions and the fermentation stages. And it's interesting. The other students would appreciate it, but different biofuels use different processes. And if we give a general description, there's a risk we'll get it wrong, and then the tutor might mark us down. I'd rather we focus on the environmental issues. Fair enough. So,、um, the main plants that are used for biofuel production now are sugarcane, corn, and canola. Of all of them, canola is probably the least harmful because machines that use it don't produce as much carbon monoxide.、Mm. Sugarcane seems to be controversial. It doesn't require as much fertilizer as corn does to grow, but when they burn the sugarcane fields, that releases loads of greenhouse gases. Yes, but some critics have suggested that the production of corn ethanol uses up more fossil fuel energy than the biofuel energy it eventually produces. For that reason, I'd say it was more harmful to the environment. I see what you mean. You're probably right. It's interesting how everyone saw the biofuel industry as the answer to our energy problems, but in some ways, biofuels have created new problems. Well, in the USA, I wouldn't say that farmers are having problems. The biofuel industry for them has turned out to be really profitable. I think, though, that even in the USA, ethanol is still only used as an additive to gasoline or petrol. The problem is that it still has to be transported by trucks or rail because they haven't built any pipelines to move it. Once they do, it'll be cheaper, and the industry might move forward. That'll have to happen one day. At least the government are in favour of biofuel development. Yes, but Brazil's probably in the lead as far as biofuels are concerned. They've got to the point where they don't need to import any oil now, which is great. And the industry in Brazil employs a huge number of people, but is it sustainable? I mean, as the population grows, and there are more vehicles on the roads, and there's more machinery, surely they can't depend so much on sugar cane. At some point, there has to be a limit on how much land can be used for sugar cane production. Certainly, if you want to preserve natural habitats and native wildlife. I think that whatever problems Brazil's facing now, the same will be true for any country. You have to weigh up the pros and cons. Well, we probably won't see an increase in biofuel use. I mean, they won't replace fossil fuels until we can find ways to produce them cheaply and quickly, and with less cost to the environment. Making sure they require minimal energy to produce. Exactly, and in a way that means they have to cost less than fossil fuels. Certainly, when you're filling up your car. Yes, and whatever other kind of engines use fossil fuels at the moment.
Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. All right. So, in the last section of the presentation, what problems are we focusing on? Well, we've already had a look at different types of pollution in the first section, so we can leave that out. But the biggest issue related to biofuels is that land is now being used to grow biofuel crops, and that's contributing to global hunger. Indeed, it doesn't seem right we're using corn to run cars when people can't afford to buy it to eat. Yes. Let's talk about that. The other thing is that in some countries, the way that biofuel crops are grown and harvested still produces a great deal of pollution, really damaging to the atmosphere. Okay, that's definitely an issue we should look at. Let's not finish on a negative note, though. Why don't we talk about the potential new sources of biofuel? So rather than corn and sugarcane. What other plants could be used?、Mm, good. Some companies are exploring the possibility of using wood and seeing how that can be used to make ethanol. Yes, and algae is another possibility. You can grow it in any water, and it absorbs pollutants too.、Mm, I read that. And grasses—they're another plant that researchers are investigating as a biofuel. And these kind of plants aren't used as food, which is why. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Good morning. Today we're thinking about the way that technology is influencing our social structures and the way we interact with one another. Humans, as we know, have always lived in groups. Without this arrangement, our species would have died out long ago. But now, the way we see and define our group is changing. I'd like to start by mentioning the research of American sociologist Mark Granovetter in 1973. It was Granovetter who first coined the term "weak ties," which he used to refer to people's loose acquaintances, in other words, friends of friends. His research showed that weak ties had a significant effect on the behavior and choices of populations. And this influence was something highly important in the fields of information science and politics, and as you can imagine, marketing also. So, these friends of friends, people we might spend time with at social or work gatherings, might not be like us, but they can still have a positive influence because we share the same sort of interests. That's enough to make a connection, and this connection can turn out to be more beneficial than we might suspect. An example of this, an example of how the connection can influence us, is when our weak ties get in touch and pass on details about jobs they think might be suitable for us. Well, since Granovetter first came up with this theory, his work has been cited in over nineteen thousand papers. Some of these studies have looked at how weak tie networks are useful to us in other ways, and one thing that seems to improve as a result of weak tie influence is our health. Today, our number of weak tie acquaintances has exploded due to the internet, to the phenomenon of online social networking. This is still a relatively new way of communication, something that has a huge amount of potential. But also, as with any invention, 
it brings with it a new set of problems. Let's start with the benefits. Without question, online social networking allows us to pass on the latest news, to be up to date with local and global events, and for many, this information comes from sources more trustworthy than local media. So this is one clear point in favor of online social networking. I know that it's also being used by students as a means of increasing their chances of success in the way that lecture notes can be shared and ideas discussed. I think, personally speaking, that we need some further research before we can definitively say whether it helps or not. There's also been a great increase in the number of networking sites devoted to sharing advice on health issues, but there are as yet no studies to prove the reliability of that advice. Now, what we do have clear evidence for is that people are developing friendships and professional networks in a way that wasn't possible before. The process is faster. I'm not talking about quality here, but simply that they exist. And it's debatable whether the number of online friends that you have increases your level of self-confidence. That's perhaps an area of research some of you might be interested in following up. Turning to the problems, there are any number of articles connecting online activity to falling levels of physical fitness, but it's too easy to blame the Internet for our social problems. The poor grades of school children are also frequently linked to the time spent on social networking sites, but it would be naive to believe there are no other contributing factors. One real concern, however, is the increase in the amount of fraud, where, for example, people are using the personal data of others which they've put online for criminal purposes. This kind of activity seems likely to continue. And then, certainly for employers, online social networking sites have provided a great time-wasting opportunity, reducing productivity like never before, and I doubt they can put a stop to this habit, no matter what restrictions are in place. We'll come back to these issues in a minute, but I'd like to say something about the theories of Robin Dunbar, an anthropologist at Oxford University. Dunbar has found that the human brain has evolved in a way that means we can only give real attention to a particular number of people. 150, apparently. So, for example, if the number of friends on your online network is greater than that, according to Dunbar, this would imply the relationships are only superficial. Dunbar is not against online relationships, but he maintains that face-to-face -face interaction is essential for the initial creation of true friendship and connections. He's concerned that for young people, if their only experience of forming relationships is online, this doesn't allow them to form the ability or acquire the strategies for maintaining relationships. For example, in situations where negotiation or diplomacy is required, or where it's essential for...